Hey everyone, welcome back. I decided that for today we're gonna do a compilation. I'll have new stories tomorrow. This is over two hours, so I hope you enjoy. And if you don't like compilations, don't worry. Like I said, I'll be back tomorrow. So there's over 20 stories here, and I didn't check every single one of them. So it's a big possibility that there's a story in here that might feature sexual harassment or sexual assault. So if you want to avoid stories like that, you might want to skip this one just to be safe. All that being said, I hope you all enjoyed the stories, and I'll see you all again tomorrow. And remember, to always, stay hungry. My name is Alexander. A few months ago, before submitting this, I had moved into a new neighborhood. Though I'm all settled in now, me and my family were close to being finished unpacking when this occurred. I go to an online school, and I'd finish decently early in the day, so I have plenty of spare time. The neighborhood I moved into has a neighborhood watch system. Basically, we all look out for each other like a big family. It's also relatively safe here, so it was a huge surprise when I woke up in the middle of the night from a loud bang coming from outside. I live on the second story of our house, a window next to my desk facing the front of the house. I sat up and I would opened the curtains of the window and I took a peek outside. You see, there's an abandoned one floor house to the left of ours which was condemned due to a type of black mold living in the walls. No one's lived there for five years or so. I was fairly surprised then when I saw a large green van in the house's driveway, seemingly trying to hide behind my own car. I pulled out my phone and I zoomed into the window of the car for a better look to see if there was anyone inside. And I saw it was empty. I looked down below my window as I had heard a bit of rustling and I had saw a man crouching in the bushes looking into my son's room right below mine. I was spotted by the man, who then quickly ran over to his van, hopped into the driver's door, and pulled away. I decided to call the police, but they said they couldn't do anything, as they haven't actually done anything except being around my lawn. So the next night, basically the same exact thing happened, except this time, someone else was with the man, they ran over to the van like before, except this time, the second one ran over to the abandoned house, lifted up the garage door, and ran inside, and the man who ran into the van pulled out. I called the cops once more, and they went over to search the house, but found nothing. So just the other day, four to five months after this occurred, I saw the same man from before, long shabby hair and a shaved beard, and he was staring out of the window watching me while I took out the garbage can to the curb by the road. Again, I called the cops one final time and they searched the house again. This time actually finding the man, taking him out of the house, and then identifying him as the previous owner of the house. The man had actually admitted to attempting to rob us, take the things which he would have stolen, and continued living in the house next door. Yeah. Pretty damn crazy. I'm a 17 year old female and the situation happened to me yesterday afternoon. My boyfriend was feeling a little sick and I wanted to run to the store to get him some stuff to make him feel better. I chose to go to a store a little ways away from my house. Big mistake. I get to the store and before I get out of my car, I feel a bit uneasy. I look around while sitting in my car, not seeing anything, and feeling like I was just being paranoid. I decided to get out of the car and then make my way into the store. As soon as I walk out of my car, I see a man, maybe in his early 30s, wearing yellow rain boots, walking faster towards my direction. Not thinking anything of it, because maybe he was in a rush to get into the store, I go along with my shopping and forget about the man. While walking through one of the aisles, I see the same man that I saw in the parking lot staring at me with his deep dark eyes. At first, I thought he saw someone he knew behind me, and I just shrugged it off. Continuing to the aisles, 
I continue to see the same man with nothing in his hands. He's just watching me grab everything I needed and following me to every section of the store. As soon as I decided to look his way, he would quickly shift his body to make it look like he was looking at something, but he just kept his dark, deep, scary eyes on me. I was getting nervous about how this man was acting, and I had gone up to the front, and I had told an employee about the strange man. They looked at me in a strange way like they didn't believe me, and they just shrugged it off. I was starting to get more and more paranoid, so I decided to go to a checkout lane. At this time, I kept looking over my shoulder to see if the man was still following me or staring at me. He disappeared, and this was the biggest sense of relief I've ever experienced. I then felt that everything was finally back to normal. I get out into the parking lot heading to the car, and I immediately sensed that someone was looking at me. I look around, and there's the same man who was in the store with me just minutes before, but this time he was closer. I ran to my car as fast as I could and threw everything in the passenger seat. I immediately locked my door, and I just barely missed him. He started smacking his hands on my window and smiling. I started the car as fast as I could, and then I dipped the hell out of that parking lot. I began to see a truck following from behind, and I was way too nervous to go home, and my intuition told me to try and lose him. I ended up rushing back home, taking the longest way possible. I thought that I lost him because he was no longer in sight, but boy was I wrong. As soon as I got inside the house, I had then heard a rev of a truck. I looked out the peephole, and sure enough, it was the same truck that I saw earlier. This guy had actually followed me home. I told my boyfriend to go do something about it, but by the time my poor sick boyfriend got outside, the truck was gone. That was probably the most scariest day of my life. I don't know what that man's intentions were, but he never did come back after that. Thank God. Stay safe out there, and don't go straight home if you feel like you're being followed like I did. It had all started when we had to move houses due to a house fire. Me and my fiance were looking for a place to live, and we'd came across a lady named Tracy. At the time, she seemed very nice, and wasn't until two months later that she would turn up on our doorstep asking if she can sleep over and crash out on our sofa. When we refused, she got really angry, and she then got in her car and drove off drunk. One week later, she came back with her husband and she wanted us out of her flat that she was renting out to us because we were a gay couple, and due to her religion, she couldn't let that happen. When I answered the door, she had pulled out a screwdriver and then stabbed me. She stabbed me in my leg, just barely missing an artery, which could have killed me. When I called the police, they then came and took her away, but her husband just got a warning. The day after that happened, her friend Christine came over asking for money from us for compensation for getting her best friend arrested. After one month, she came back drunk out to the flat with a needle and syringe filled with a clear liquid. She said that she wanted to give us a moving in gift that would make us sleep. When I asked her what was in it, she said that her friend Christine gave her heroin, enough that would take us off the earth. I called the police and they arrived and found her, but they couldn't find the needle. We eventually found out that she had thrown the needle in the drain, and she was once again arrested. Well, a few nights later, after she got released from jail, she came back once again with two guys. She kicked in our door with the guys who had weapons on them. Luckily, we had managed to climb out of the window, but God only knows what would have happened to us if we didn't get out of there. We ended up moving the hell away from that area shortly after, as it was a really bad area full of drug dealers. The story takes place in October of last year. I was in my room around 8.30 p.m. when everything began to occur. I had just walked back into my room after speaking with my brother who was in the upstairs living room right next to my room. I had heard a revving noise coming from right outside. 
I had my blinds cracked so I could see out, but it would be hard to see in. There was a dark truck that was backing up to my brother's GMC Envoy, parked at the curb just outside of our house. It took my brain all of three seconds to put together what was about to happen. A man had smashed in my brother's window and was trying to get inside. I lifted up my blinds very fast and then screamed. Hey, what the fuck do you think you're doing? Get the fuck away from our car! The man saw me and he panicked, but he then pointed up at me, then yelling back. Shut the fuck up, you little bitch! Now, I'm a stubborn and big-mouthed girl that sometimes really doesn't know when to shut up. So, before I hopped in the truck, I then yelled out, No, fuck you, asshole! And I then yelled at my brother, Yo, Sean, there's some assholes breaking into your car. My pit bull and I go barreling out of my room. The guy had gotten into the truck and was taking off down the street. We then ran inside and told our parents what was going on but immediately ran back out to the front yard. I had noticed across the street that another car had been tampered with, but left alone. My neighbors had come outside, and I had to explain everything that happened. We all went silent when we heard the loud motor of the engine pass by down the end of our street. Now, two things happened at this point. My stepdad had gotten on the phone with the local police department, letting them know of the situation. The other, well, my mom in nothing but a nightshirt had gotten into her car and she had spanned down the street where we had showed her. After speaking with the police, we had waited in the yard when we all heard the loud engine again and it was moving fast. I ran to the corner, barefoot and in my pajamas to see the truck hauling ass out of the neighborhood. I started to run, but by this time it had started to pour. Not too far behind me, my mom's car came flying down the street in pursuit of the truck. By the time I had reached the end of the neighborhood, my mom was chasing him through the red light and was then following them onto the freeway. My neighbor's friend had gotten into his truck to go help my mom and I pointed out where to go. My mom had followed them onto the freeway, but had soon lost them. She said that when she went looking for them, she had spotted the truck parked, but still on, next to a white work van. When she got closer, they both sped off and my mom chased the truck. She said she tried to read the license plate, but due to the rain and the fact that she didn't have her reading glasses, she couldn't make it out. We both told our stories to the police and we found out that they had actually broken into a car further down the street before they took off to ours. My brother had apparently left his backpack in his car and that's what the creeps had saw. I couldn't make out the driver But the man who had cursed up at me was a man with a white hat, and that's all I could get. The reason I bring this up now is that in January, the truck flew by our house, causing my mom and me to stay on high alert all night. But just last month, I was home alone while my parents were in Italy, and I heard them again. It was almost midnight, but I had sat up in bed looking out my window to then see the truck creep by my house before they sped off down the street. They were in a lifted dark Ford with four doors and it had a custom engine. The truck was also older, so it was a little easier to identify. Every time I think back to that night, I always think, why were those idiots breaking into cars so early in the evening? And what would have happened if one of the men had a gun when I decided to open my big mouth? Be safe out there, everyone. There really are some crazy idiots out, and it really is terrifying. Does anyone remember that big power outage back in the summer of 2003 that affected most of the southeast Canada and the northeastern United States? Maybe not, but I'll tell you about it. I was 16 at the time, and I was about to enter my junior year of high school. I was still living in my parents' house in Michigan, and both of them were away at work. I forget what my brother was doing, but he wasn't at the house either. I was home alone during the afternoon. My parents had told me that someone was coming by to take a look at our air conditioner that afternoon and to let him in. A couple of hours before the technician was scheduled to arrive, 
the power went out. Now, I didn't realize that it was a nationwide outage at first, and I thought it was just a small blackout. I was in my room reading a magazine when I then heard a knock at the door. I looked out my window and I saw a red van in the driveway. I figured it was the air conditioner guy and I walked to the front door to let him in. I opened the door and I saw two men standing at the entrance of my house. Right away, it seemed odd. I thought only one guy was coming, not two. Also, they weren't dressed in any uniforms of any kind. They were just wearing t-shirts and jeans. They also had no tools, no instruments, clipboards, or anything you would think a pair of technicians would have. They were just standing there. I greeted them with a quick hello, and one replied back. Hi, are your parents home? Nah, they're not, I replied. Oh, well, we're here from the electrical company. We're investigating the recent power outage, and our reports indicate the connection to your home may be faulty. We need to come inside and take a look at your fuse box. Wait, you're not here to look at the air conditioner? I asked them curiously. Well, we can take a look at that while we're here if you'd like. And he began to enter. Okay, but someone's coming by to look at the air conditioner today as well. He's supposed to get here soon. I tell him. Right away, they both got nervous looks on their faces. The guy walking inside stopped dead in his tracks. He turned to the guy outside, and they exchanged glances. The guy outside just shook his head, and he made the finger across his throat gesture. Then he looked at me and said hesitantly, Okay, well, uh, we don't want to interrupt his work. We'll come back another time. We have other houses to look at. And they turned around, and they started making their way back towards their van. As they were walking away, I had noticed what looked like a flip knife clipped to one of their belts. They got back to their van, and they drove away, tires squealing down the street. They were going a lot faster than they should have been in a residential area. I just stood there completely confused. It was such a strange encounter. Still... I was really relieved that they were gone, but seeing that knife really unsettled me. About 20 minutes later, I saw another van pull up. This time, however, I could actually see the logo of the heating and cooling company on the side of the van, and a man walked out in full uniform. He knocked on the door, and I answered. He then explained that because of the huge multi-state power outage, he couldn't diagnose the air conditioner problem properly. And since he was already on his way, he figured he would just come by and let us know since he couldn't get through on the phone. Wait, this is all over the country? I thought this was just in the area. A couple of guys from the electrical company came by just before you got here and they wanted to look at the fuse box. I told him. A surprised expression came over his face. He explained that he had worked for an electrical company for 10 years prior to his current job and he said that he never went to individual houses to look at fuse boxes during power outages, and there would be no reason to ever do so. I told him the details of my brief encounter with them, and my heart sank in fear as he informed me in a very concerned and dead serious voice that he was absolutely certain those men were not from the electrical company. He told me I should tell my parents about it and have them tell the police. I just stood there speechless for a moment, the gravity of what had occurred and what could have happened finally hitting me like a sledgehammer. He explained that he couldn't stay and he had to get back to the office. I couldn't thank him enough for coming and explaining that to me. I then told my dad everything that happened when he got home. He stormed out of my house in a furious rage and he went to my neighbor's house since they had a generator working and they used their phone to call the police. When he got back, he told me that while he was there, he had talked to the neighbors about it, and they had told him that the people living across the street had seen that van pull up to some other houses as well. The guys knocked on the door, and when nobody answered, they moved on to our house. It wasn't until the next day that the police had arrived to take a statement, as everything was in disarray with the power outage, and they were way too busy handling other emergencies. 
I told the officers what had happened, but without a license plate number, there really wasn't much for them to go on. They left and I just spent the next few weeks in total fear, dreading that those guys would come back. Thankfully though, they never did. As far as I know, nothing ever came of the police report and those guys were never caught. Looking back at it though, it was very stupid of me for to just take those imposters at their word that they were really from the electrical company. I would have been alone with two armed and dangerous criminals during a massive power outage with no way to call the police. I realize now just how naive I was and that I should have been much more vigilant and never admitted to those guys that I was home alone or let them inside. I have no idea what they were planning and I don't think I want to know. What scares me the most is they didn't break into an unoccupied house. They wanted someone to answer the door and let them in. They weren't deterred by my presence, and they only left when they found out that the air conditioning guy was on his way. That tells me then they weren't likely there to just simply rob my house. They were probably going to do something to me as well. So here's my advice to everyone out there. Never ever allow people into your home without verifying who they really are first, even if you're expecting someone. You just never really know who you're dealing with otherwise. I hope everyone stays safe. I was a manager of a movie theater. I did this for 11 years while I was in high school and finishing college. This was in the late 90s before everyone had cell phones. Now, our theater was an old one from 1985. It had two main halls with a concession stand in the middle. We didn't have the business and staff to run both sides of the stand as well as both halls. So we put a huge standee to cover hall one and directed all traffic to hall two. I came in after school and opened the front door and I left it open for my employee that I saw driving up as I went inside. I didn't wait for him because I had to use the restroom. I ducked behind the standee and ran to the restroom. We had gone over and over that you need to pull the door behind you because people show up early before we open and they try and come sit in the lobby while we're getting set up with loose cash all over. Well, Drew left the door open. I came out of the restroom and I went to the door to head upstairs to the office and start the day of setting up and treading all the projectors while Drew got the stand ready. As I opened the door and looked up the stairs, there's a large dark-skinned man holding Drew by the arm and he had a gun pointed at me. He yelled, Get up here now! Open up the safe! I just smiled and said, Hi, how are you? I came up the stairs and pulled Drew away from the man and I then stood between him and the armed robber. Drew was 16 and just a kid. I opened the door and I told Drew to sit on the other side of the desk in the corner. I propped open the door and put my things on the desk. We had three phones in this office. He then yelled at Drew to pull the one behind him off the wall. The robber grabbed the office drop slips from the tray on the wall and ripped the phone from the desk out, as well as the one behind him from the computers. I got down on the ground and started to open the safe. Now, this was a Monday so we hadn't had the time to send back our extra petty cash for the weekend that the armored driver took Mondays. We had thousands in cash, more than normal business days. He throws a small bag at me and he tells me to put the cash in. I took my time and emptied every bag. I really did my best to unnerve him as I was cool and calm and my heart wasn't even racing. We have two boxes with 500 and quarters each. He wanted them in his bag, but they wouldn't fit. He points the gun at me, and he tells me to make them fit. I said they won't, and I let them fall out on his foot. He makes Drew empty his backpack. Drew put all of his things under the desk out of sight, because he didn't want him to take his electronics and whatnot. I put all the money in the backpack, and I step up in his space to hand him the bag. I'm five foot eight and I had on high heels, making me about six foot. I'm tall, slim, and blonde, 
but I can also lift with the guys. I was now eye to eye with this fat ass man. I was showing no fear. He just kept telling me, Back up! Back up! Stand over there! Stop looking at me! And I would just smile at him. When you're young, you think you will live forever. I just wanted him to run away from us and to be intimidated by me so that he knew I would do something if he tried to touch us. He just kept telling me to back up and turn around and also telling Drew to come around the desk. I gave the guy an evil look and he then said back, I just need him to open the doors for me. As they turned to leave, I ditched my shoes and I ran across the hall to the projection booth as soon as his back was turned. I called the police and I then told them we've been robbed, that he took my employee and that they're still in the building. Drew came up the stairs looking for me and I then told him that I was on the phone with 911. He told me that the getaway car was a red Honda with a female driver. The cops made it within five minutes. The weirdest thing was before the police showed up. An employee who worked down the street and an eye master showed up banging on the door, yelling, asking if we're okay, and to open the doors. And at the same time, the other manager that I worked with was calling while I was on the phone with 911. When I answered his call, he just kept yelling, asking what's happening, saying how he had this bad feeling that we were in trouble and that he needed to be here with us. I'm in the car now on the freeway headed to you. I'm five minutes away. He said. The employee then said how he was standing at the counter at work, and suddenly he knew that he needed to get to the theater right away. He told his other co-worker to watch the place, and then ran to get us. I guess that I broadcasted a mental alarm or something. My mother called me on her lunch break asking what's happening as well. She said that she felt doom wash over her in her meeting, and then called when she got out. Three weeks later, I was at work, managers and training in Dallas, and I then get a pager alert to call my mother and some other number. I told the district manager something's going on, and I called. It was the Arlington Police Department. They arrested a man that they think is the gunman, and that I needed to come up and do a lineup. I told all the managers that I had to go, and they told me to go, go get him. I was able to point him out within seconds. I had to actually go to a trial and stand on the witness stand and point him out. He actually tried to claim it was a fake gun. I told everyone there that I'm a member of the National Rifle Association. I know guns. He took a plea deal after that. 25 years until he can get parole, which is coming up next year. As it turns out, he kidnapped a bank employee just a week after robbing me. I really hope he learns his lesson in jail. I learned that I can stay cool as a cucumber in stressful situations. Drew thanked me for trying to protect him. I'm just glad both of us ended up okay and then neither one of us got shot. I'm a 37 year old female who grew up in the 90s to early 2000s in a subdivision on the western slope of Colorado. In this suburb, there were quite a few kids around my age. My childhood friend lived across the road from me, and her and I would constantly play together and ride bikes. There were a few neighborhood kids that would tease and pick on my friend, and I occasionally as well. In our subdivision, we had a new family move in with their two kids. They were homeschooled, and they were very sheltered children now that I think about it. One evening... The whole subdivision of kids were out in force riding around on bikes. And of course, my friend and I became the target of taunts and name calling while being laughed at. Around this time, the new kids came out to ride with the rest of us. The teasing took a pivot and was now targeted on the new kids. I'm ashamed to say that I also started to pick on them too, just to fit in. As I was picking on one of the kids, I had seen their mom sitting in the garage watching her kids and the rest of us. This scared me. In my little kid mind, I thought she was going to come out and yell at me and the others. As I was getting ready to pedal home and ride, their dad came speeding down the road and pulled into the family driveway extremely aggressively. 
Now I'm really scared. Thanking the mom and called him to come home because we were picking on their kids. As I'm sitting there thinking of all the horrible outcomes that are about to happen to me and my fellow bullies, the father slams his car door and walks up to his wife when they're then having a really heated argument that I can't hear. My fear has reached the peak, and I then pedaled home as fast as I could to go hide. Meanwhile, I hear the mother calling to her kids to come in for the night. As I headed my house, I started to calm down, and I eventually forgot all about my fear of being scolded. My ease was not to last, as within a couple of hours of going inside, several police cars had swarmed the neighbor's house. My parents and my older brother all just watched through our living room window, trying to figure out what was going on. And my little kid had, the mom and dad had called the cops on all of us kids for picking on their children. But as the situation had progressed, no law enforcement came to talk to my parents about my bad behavior. As I woke up the next day for school and stood at the bus stop with all the other kids, they were all talking about what happened. One kid said that the parents were gang members and shots were fired on the house or that the dad had taken the lives of his family. Well, it wasn't until a few years later when I was in my early teens when I'd actually heard the facts of what actually happened that night. So, I guess the mother and father having just bought this new house in our subdivision were now having financial trouble along with the wife not happy in the marriage and had asked for a separation early in the day. In the evening, when she'd let the kids come out to play with the rest of us, the dad came home extremely angry with her. As time had progressed that evening, their argument had reached a peak, and the father feeling frustrated and that all hope was lost, went out to his car, pulled out a pistol, and ended his life. Since there was a gun involved, it brought a lot of uniformed officers to our neighborhood. EMTs were also called due to the nature of the father's wound to the head, but he was dead on sight. Looking back at it now as an adult, I can't help but feel so much sorrow for that family. I mean, damn, those poor kids. As a mother, how do you even explain that? What can you even say? I always wondered how they're doing if their childhood ended up being a happy one, even with this tragedy. I never saw them again after that night, but I sure can remember their little faces. Mental health is no joke or something to shrug off. If you're struggling, or you know a loved one who is, reach out and try and help or find support. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my story. For reference, I'm a 26-year-old female living near the Memphis, Tennessee area. I travel to East Tennessee a good bit, either to visit my boyfriend when he's out of town or to go visit my Tennessee Hummer family. We always plan meetups and drive our Hummers through the mountains. This time, however, I was traveling to do both. My boyfriend was staying in a hotel in Nashville, Tennessee. I drove the three to four hour drive to go spend the weekend with him and I would visit my Hummer family while I was gone to work during the day. I had a pretty decent drive, nothing too crazy. I got close to where I was about an hour away from getting off the interstate and being at the hotel. I started to debate if I wanted to stop and take a bathroom break and get a snack before I go to the hotel and crashed, and I'm so glad I decided against it. Let me tell you why. Once I made it to the hotel, I got out of my Hummer and I took my pistol out of my car holster and I put it into my waistband holster like I always do when traveling. I unloaded my luggage and headed inside. It was about 12 to 1 a.m. I believe at that time. For reference, my boyfriend's hotel room was like a small apartment. Once you walked in, on your right was the fridge, counters, and mini island cooking area. To your left was a closet, then the bathroom right behind it. Behind the wall of the bathroom was the first bed. This was the bed we were sleeping on to be blocked from the door just in case something happened. I get up to my boyfriend's room and he then greets me at the door. I go inside and I then get ready to take a quick shower before we go to bed. Once I finished, I went into the bedroom, got dressed, and was snuggled for a while. He had been out of town a lot, so it was nice to be with him again. 
A few minutes later, we're laying in the bed and we hear some running and screaming from down the hallway. We were really confused, but we guessed it was probably just someone's kid playing or something. Forgetting that it was midnight and the screams weren't all that loud, or maybe they were just too far down the hallway to tell. Well, we continued to lay there, but we were quiet, and we kind of just listened. About a minute or two later, we hear a pop. It didn't really click in our minds what it was, that is, until the second pop came, and my boyfriend threw me over the bed, and then threw me on the floor behind our bed. Someone was outside our room shooting. We lay there on the floor with our guns drawn just in case we needed to protect ourselves, as we didn't know what was going on in that moment. So we waited. Once it was quiet for a while, my boyfriend phoned the front desk and they said that the police would be here soon. We both just waited and watched out the window. Now, I won't be mentioning the hotel's name. I couldn't even remember it if I tried, to be honest, because I don't want to get any legal issues after me. I didn't want to share this story with someone though, just in the hopes that I get across to some ladies the very importance of having something to protect yourself with. If I didn't have my pistol and I turned that corner off the hallway to the elevators on the main hallway, I have no idea what I would have done. If you do have a pistol, please take it with you everywhere. Have it loaded at all times on your person. You never know when you may need it. The cops eventually had the road to the hotel blocked off and across from the hotel was a big field. They searched the field while a unit searched the hotel. We waited, watching the whole scene unfold. We saw a stretcher come out of the lobby with a black bag. We all knew what that meant. After we heard a commotion outside in our hallway, we got a bit worried until we then heard, LeBan and police, is anyone hurt? We went to the door and we looked out the peephole and we told them no, we're fine. They continued down the hallway knocking on everyone's doors. We sat there for hours just waiting for them to finish up. When they finally left, it was about 6am and my boyfriend went to go to work. I kind of just sat there in the room until my sister-in-law came up to the room to sit with me until my boyfriend and his brother got back from work. We sat there watching movies until about an hour later and they got back to the room. They couldn't even think about work at the time. We all just hung out in the room together for a bit, talking about what happened and all the blood and bullet holes that were in the walls. There was a bullet hole in the wall right outside of our room and there was blood all over the door of the stairwell as well as all the walls that passed our room. I'm just so thankful that I didn't stop and take a bathroom break when I thought about it because I probably would have been right in the middle of it all. We lost a lot of sleep that weekend, and we still get jumpy anytime we stay in a hotel now. It was such an insane experience, and I'm just really glad we all lived to see another day. We heard that the shooter was the one who was carried out in the body bag. A guest apparently pulled their gun out and ended their spree before it got too bad. We aren't really sure if that happened, though. No one really told us anything, my boyfriend and brother-in-law just heard from their co-workers or around the hotel. It's still surreal to me that I could have been right in the middle of it all if I had actually decided on stopping. Moving forward, I will always continue to drive unless I physically can't. I will keep my full name in the place of the event anonymous due to personal reasons but I felt like sharing it might help in the long run with the PTSD coping process. So here's my story. It was November 27th, 2018. I was working as an assembly worker in a window manufacturing plant inserting glass into frames and then securing them before they were loaded into the delivery trucks to be shipped out to customers. A co-worker and I were talking about the holiday season and what we had planned to do with our families. It was only 30 minutes into our shift, 6.30 a.m. to be exact, when four pops rang throughout the factory. Reacting to this, myself and a couple of the other workers initially thought it was just a mechanical failure on the line. That is, until two more bangs echoed throughout the factory. Only then did we know for certain, they were gunshots. 
It sounded as if they were coming from the shipping area, no more than a hundred feet away from my section of the assembly line. We all then ran to the nearest fire exit and luckily made it to the parking lot. Once outside and safely away from the building, I called my parents to let them know of the situation and no matter what happened, I loved them. Soon enough, the shooting stopped and we were ordered back into the building once police arrived on the scene. The factory instructed us to continue working for an extra 30 minutes, but in actuality, none of us were feeling very productive after that. We were all sent home, and from here my memory is a little blank, as it was a trans blur throughout the following hours. The news story later came out how an employee threatened the shooter's wife, and that the shooter had taken it upon himself to make an example. He held an employee at gunpoint and demanded him to escort him to the said employee, and once there, he opened fire. Luckily, nobody was killed, but the employee who was targeted was hit in the ankle and kneecap before the shooter left the premises, but he was eventually caught by authorities just a mile away. I really struggle with the shooting, in a sense that I'm constantly aware of those around me, and I never fully trust anyone, minus a few. It did, however, motivate me to pursue a higher standard of life, and being that it was my first month at the job, I left shortly afterwards. I'm now in the US Navy working in the aviation field, seeing the world and learning to live life for life. So I guess that's a happy ending. Anyway, thank you for taking the time to hear my story, and to everyone out there listening, be safe. I'm a vendor at Walmart, and I've been doing my job for over three years now. I do various tasks like stocking the shelves, taking inventory, and also installing displays. This particular day was like any other. I always work alone, and I'm not required to do any form of customer service. I was on my way down to the grocery aisle, and before I could exit the aisle, I had to allow customers to proceed while pushing their carts. As I backed up slightly, I felt something behind me. I turned my head and I saw a man behind me, and I then caught myself before I said excuse me. Once I realized he had no cart or merchandise and was literally pressed up behind me, he looked up at me and he then said, It looks like you bumped me with your ass, with his male parts on my butt. I gave him a glare and I then immediately walked away to the other side of the store. I was in such shock and disgust that I just wanted to get away as far as possible. I found myself in the toy section catching my breath and also processing what had just happened when I looked up and I see the same man. He then looked at me while I was at the end of the aisle and he was then beginning with an evil laugh, then saying to me, So we meet again, do we? I then dropped the cart with all the items I needed to work, and I just ran to the back stock area. I then hid for as long as I could, before I went back out on the floor clocked out and went straight home. Thankfully, however, I didn't see the man again there, and I really hope I never do. This may not be that scary to many others out there, but it was definitely a scary moment for me. This happened to me when I went to Walmart. I usually come with my cousin or niece, but on this particular day, I went by myself. While grabbing a shopping cart, I saw a couple of guys by the flower area. I didn't really think anything of it. As I was checking my list on my phone, I felt that I was being watched by one of them. As I turned, I saw one of the guys staring at me with the creepiest smile, so I just turned and walked away to the stationary section. As I was looking for the things that I was looking for, I saw one of them standing like maybe a couple of feet away from me, still just staring. I started to get creeped out, and I walked away. As I walked away though, I saw the second guy standing on the other side where I was at. I saw them exchanging looks, and then signaling to each other something that I couldn't really understand, but I just knew that it was bad. As I was turning my head, I saw the guy following me, 
and he looked like he was on the phone, but I couldn't make out what he was saying because he was talking low. So I quickly grabbed the rest of my things and started to go to the self-checkout. As I was scanning my items, I saw the first guy purchasing some things, but I had also seen what he was getting. There was duct tape, rope, pills, and gloves. And from that, I just knew something was up. I tried to tell one of the workers, but I was afraid the guys would hear me. So I acted like I wanted to return something back to them. That's when I then told the worker the whole situation. The worker then paid security while the two men were by the exit. It looked like they were waiting for someone. Just then, the security came out to the front of the store and he was talking to the two men before escorting them out. I didn't really know what else had happened once they went outside. Once I was given the clear to go outside, I then saw a police car and the two men were inside the car. So what I was later told by the security guard was that these two men were apparently charged with attempted potential kidnapping. When the second police officer was checking the men's car, they found a whole list of a lot of things they had planned to do with whomever they were going to kidnap, as well as a shovel and a layout of a certain area of the woods with a red X on it. If I hadn't turned around at that very moment, things would have turned a lot worse, or deadly even. This all started about two years ago when I first started high school. Just to let you know, it still continues to this day. I met this one older guy who had lied about his age to me. He had been a junior while I was a freshman. Although he was 18, I was 15, and at the time he had told me he had just turned 16. I had met him in my college class, as I had started early with getting college credits. A lot of people start young, so I didn't really think anything of it when he told me he had been 16. After my first class, he approached me after we had been released, and he asked for my socials. Now, I don't know how it works with everyone else, but I would rather give my phone number than my socials, just to keep it private if it doesn't end up well. And so, I had given him my number. We can call him Ethan. I would let my friends know all about Ethan. For context, I didn't have many close friends, and I wasn't very open about myself. They were all into the little situation, as he was quite attractive. Later on that day, I had gone to work, and I had told them about Ethan. There were also other teens who went to the same school as me, and one of the boys had told me about Ethan and how he sells drugs to minors. I didn't really process the minors part, as I thought he was a minor himself. I didn't even let it bother me, as this was a time where every teen was pretty much into drugs. This guy Nick, for example, he had also informed me how Ethan was once his best friend and that he wasn't really great with girls and relationships. Looking back, it seems kind of stupid on how I ignored all these red flags as I wasn't so great with trusting on what people had to say. So the next day, Ethan is already asking to hang out, so I said sure. He wanted to head to his house, but I would rather go to mine. Again, just to stay safe. And so we did. We head to my house, and by now he could drive. Now, a 16-year-old in my school is a sophomore and isn't allowed to drive until junior and senior year. Now, me as a freshman, I hadn't realized these rules, and I just thought of how cool it had been getting a ride home rather than going on the bus. My parents weren't home, and don't usually get home until late. So we ended up watching two movies, and going into the third one, he had realized my parents weren't getting home. By now, he had moved extremely close to me. Arms were touching, and that was it so far. Ethan had then asked me if we could do anything sexual. Being 15, I said no, as I wasn't really experienced or knew much about how all that worked. He asked me about three more times, and then he got mad and left when I kept saying no. Now for this not to take too long, I won't go into much detail for the next part. I would let my friends know what happened, and they didn't really approve, but I still wanted to give Ethan another try. Well, about four months later, we'd gotten extremely close. 
but he had still asked me from time to time to do sexual activities with him, which I always declined. Now, about six months in, we wanted to start a real relationship. Looking back now, though, I really should have seen what his actual plan was. He asked me to go to his home. By now, we were in the makeout phase, so that's what we did for a good minute. Then he tried going for a sexual move, and I backed away. He had gotten pretty angry, and he had even started yelling at me about how girlfriends let their boyfriends have sex, and they never say no. He kept on yelling about how stubborn I am, and I need to become submissive to him. I was really afraid to even say anything, as he had multiple pocket knives on him, as well as butterfly knives in his room. But I really had enough, and I had said a few harsh things that I now regret, as it probably led to why he stalked me around. I didn't live too far from his house, so I left, and I then walked to my own home. Well, about two days later, I find out that he had gotten into five different hookups with five different girls, having sex with three of them. I only found out because my coworker told me about it. By this time, I ended up ghosting him and losing all contact with him. Ethan wasn't very fond with the disconnection, and he had gone to my house multiple times, as well as making many threats to me and my parents. My dad had finally had enough and called the cops. Now, I wasn't really sure what happened to Ethan in that situation, but all I know is that he didn't learn from it. Three or four months later, I had ran into Ethan at a Walmart. At this time, I was now 16 and I was practicing driving by running errands. He had been following me around until I confronted him. He started to apologize for everything he did and how he wanted to start all over with me. I had declined and he had gotten into one of those very angry phases that he used to have before. Although he probably realized we were in public and didn't want to cause a scene, he ended up leaving me alone, and I was able to finish up what I had been doing. Going back to my car, I put all of my groceries in, and I headed to the driver's seat, until I felt an arm wrap around my arms and chest. I also felt something cold and thin under my shirt near my abdomen, I was frozen in shock, and I couldn't properly think about what to do. We stood like this silently for about two minutes, until he started mumbling why I couldn't love him back, and how he really wants to only make me happy. I still didn't say anything, however, making him impatient. I felt whatever he was holding down against my skin go in deeper. He hadn't stabbed me, but he had just put the lining of a knife right up against my skin. No blood was drawn, but there was an older man who looked to be about in his mid-twenties who noticed the position I was in, and then started threatening to call the cops. Ethan ended up running away to his car, all while yelling, You bitch! You set me up! Ever since then, he didn't come near me again. Recently though, about one or two and a half months ago, he started showing up again, but from afar. I see him from time to time just lurking. I had gotten the cops involved, and I was able to get a restraining order. No, it didn't stop him from following me around. It really creeps me out whenever I see Ethan, but there's no stress, as I know he won't come near. I now have a boyfriend, and I've also told him the whole story. I make sure that whenever I go out, to always be accompanied by someone for safety. From what I know about what happened with Ethan, he dropped out of high school senior year and he had a set of twins. I don't know who the girl is, but I do know that he had left them and continues to hook up with younger girls from ages 17 to 24. Now, I never found out his true age until I was about to turn 17, him now being 21. This may not be as scary as the other encounters, but knowing you're being followed and watched frequently surely sends chills down my spine. And yes, Ethan does still follow me around, and he's sometimes confronted by my boyfriend or my friends. I'll be sure to provide an update if anything ever happens to him, or if there are any other crazy actions committed towards me, my family, or my friends. Let me start off by telling you a little bit about myself. 
as it's relevant to why it affected me the way it did. First off, I'm a very short female. At the time, I was 18 years old. I hadn't graduated high school, and I had just gotten my first car. Since I wanted to get to know my car a little better, and I wasn't patient enough to drive only in my free time, I'd driven to and from class every day. Honestly, I felt kind of stupid doing that, since my high school was literally 20 minutes away by foot, so I was considering walking more. But being infatuated with finally having my own wheels actually won the battle. Now, I think it's only fair to tell you about my beloved car as well, right? Well, she was a really beat up small car from 1998. Sometimes the driver's door would get stuck and wouldn't open up unless you shake the living daylights out of it. And I'd have to get out of the passenger door if that happened. Because, like I said, I'm really too small to make a difference. To add to that, my horn had a mind of its own and it would only work when it wanted to and neither of my back windows would work as well. They were propped up by small wooden chops. Otherwise, when you'd hit a pothole, they'd crack open and get stuck. All right, I think that's enough info about us. Let's get into the actual story. It was a sunny late spring day, and I had classes in first shift, basically until 3 p.m. As usual, I woke up late and drove to class, parking my car behind the school and leaving it there all day until I'm done. I remember this day being particularly busy, so after class, I was late and tired, and I couldn't really be bothered to drive around town to practice my skills. Instead, I hopped in my car, rolled my working windows down, and I blasted some metal to ease my fatigue. So here's the thing, I like my music really loud, and I often get weird looks driving on the streets, so I would ignore people unless they were in my way. I was in a rush to get home. Usually I'd turn from the main street down a bridge and then take the turn for my street, but this time I wanted to leave my car in my rented garage instead of leaving it in front of the flat that I lived in, which means that I took a less populated and really tight path circling some other flats. My garage is right between two big flag corporations, and in order to get to it, you have to drive your car up a sidewalk, cross it, and then somehow get in the tight space in front of the metal box garage with both walls of each flat attempting to grace each door simultaneously. There's just enough space to get out of the car and open the doors. The reason I'm telling you all this is so you can imagine how the process works. I rolled my car down the tight street, laughed internally at some old lady staring at me, and prepared to climb the sidewalk to get to my garage. Suddenly, I saw a really skinny tall guy with no shoes on slowly wobbling down the sidewalk with his head half stuck inside a weird shimmery bag. He wasn't really phased by my car about to go on the sidewalk, so I stopped midway, front wheels on the sidewalk and back wheels on the road, and I waited for him to pass, but he didn't though. He took his head out of the bag and stopped right in front of my car, staring at me intently. I think he was mumbling something, but even though I still had my windows rolled all the way down with my music still playing, I couldn't hear him at all. I lowered the volume and I was just about to ask him if he needed something or if he could move away so I could pass, but he then took the chance while I was doing that to start walking as fast as he could to my door. I freaked out and I then slammed my finger on the window button to bring it back up. I believe it reached one or two centimeters away from fully being closed when he was breathing in my door. Properly hyperventilating by now, and with him out of my way, I kicked the car into gear and I flew up the sidewalk, quite literally, as it's pretty high off the ground and the car had to climb up. As my garage is really close at that point, I had to jump on the brakes so I wouldn't ram my garage door at full speed. I stopped and locked my doors but then turned around really fast to see where the guy was. He was then peeking behind one of the flat walls, with eyes wide and his mouth half open. I looked forward again, trying to get my phone out to call either of my parents to check if anyone was home, and neither one of them picked up because they were at work. I kept calling my mom, and just as she picked up, I looked at my side 
and I then saw the guy parallel to my driver's door. He saw me look, and he then slammed his palms right on my window. Then with his mouth wide open, he stuck his face on my window too. I screeched in my phone, and I had totally freaked out to my mom, who by that point was just screaming on the phone. What's going on? Where are you? I began just screeching at her that a guy was stuck on my window, and he was staring at me. She freaked out even more, then saying, What? Can't you get out of there? Just drive somewhere else. But I couldn't. It was way too tight to make a turn to leave, and if I forced my way in reverse, I'd run through his feet. Also, to get out of the passenger door, I'd have to hit a tree or hit the other flat's wall. So I just pushed my back into my seat, and I had tried to pretend that I didn't see him. He was literally slapping his palms on my window and moaning. I saw that his fly was open too. I don't know how to explain it, but then I guess some adrenaline kicked in as I started my car haphazardly and threw it in reverse. The guy jumped back and then slowly walked behind my car, basically cutting me off again. I then saw a car drive off the main road behind me and I tried to honk at it, but my horn didn't make a sound. I honestly don't know if I was more scared or angry at this point, considering to just let the car rip in reverse and hope he jumps away in the last second. As I switched in reverse and the car slowly started rolling, he just crooked his head to the side, and when I was about 15 centimeters away from him, he just started walking away. I stopped on the sidewalk, trying to see where he'd go and if I'd really have to take my car out on the main road and hide. But he just kept walking down the road with his bag turned to me like nothing even happened. Then when he was almost out of sight, he stuck his face back into the shimmery bag and then he turned into the neighboring street. I think I stayed there for 10 minutes locked in my car, half expecting him to show up again with newfound energy. But no, he didn't show up again. I reluctantly went out to my car, opened the garage, and drove the car in. I locked it all up, and then ran home like there's no tomorrow. Hopefully my story serves as a piece of advice for someone else out there. Please be careful with people, and always be prepared with a way out. Nothing bad happened to me, thankfully, but it's always better to be safe with a plan, just in case. The story happened in spring 2021. For the sake of the story, I'm going to call myself Anita. I'm a 27-year-old Haitian-American woman, and me and two of my female cousins that I'll refer to as Janice and Julia decided to take a trip to Haiti in May 2021. We had first visited a small countryside town called Cap Haitian to visit our grandparents who lived there. Our first week went pretty well, we enjoyed the beach, spent time with family, and we had really enjoyed the food and sceneries. But the horror all happened when we visited the Porto Prince to see more of our family and friends. Me and my cousins rented out a car for our time in the capital. One day we decided to go out to run some errands late in the afternoon and buy some souvenirs from when we would go back to Florida. We pulled over to the side of a random street to check out some souvenirs we could buy from a street vendor. And all of a sudden, an old diesel Toyota Land Cruiser with blacked out windows came into the street at full speed, and instantly we went into panic mode. One man in the Land Cruiser started to open the door, and I could already see big military weapons. So we started running, and as we were running, we heard gunshots. We then quickly ran into the small alleyway. An inhabitant spotted us and understood what was going on, and he made us hide in his hut. We hid there for what felt like 40 minutes to an hour. Afterwards, we profusely thanked the inhabitant, and he kindly but firmly told us to get back home as soon as possible. When we went back out onto the main road, our car was still there, so we got inside and locked the door, and then drove back to our family's house. For the rest of our time in Haiti, we mostly just remained inside, and only went out when it was only necessary. Fast forward to now, there's been a lot of cases of kidnappings, and sadly, not many people have survived going there. We will not be going back to Haiti for a while.
This happened when I was about seven to eight years old. I don't remember all of the details, and it's since become a blur to me after a few years. The story happened on my first day back to school, one day before my birthday. My mother had asked me where I wanted to go for my birthday, and I had the perfect idea in mind, which I told her. I said that I wanted to go to Chuck E. Cheese. She said that we could go, but I would miss school that Friday. Though I didn't really mind, because you know as kids we love missing school. When I woke up that day, I had this strange feeling that I was missing something. But after a few minutes, I couldn't figure it out. I just hopped out of bed and put on my best outfit. I then headed down the stairs and met my mom downstairs. Now, I don't really remember exactly what she said, but when I asked her about this now, it makes much more sense. She told me that the family on my dad's side was going to be coming over. Now, to give a little context, my dad died when I was about six years old, and I only ever saw his family once, which was at his funeral. We never really had any conversations with them, but I knew my mom didn't really like them with the glare she gave them that day. That's it for context. I had asked her why they were coming over, but all she told me was that she owes it to my dad. I shrugged it off and just continued my day as usual. We went out to eat around 12, and we went to the Chuck E. Cheese at 6 when the sun just began to set. When we arrived, my mom sat in the car for a few seconds, taking a deep breath, and then walking us inside. I remember my mom's face when she then saw my dad's brother, her face pale and cold. She shook his hand, and she then immediately told me to go play on the play place. As a kid, I didn't really pay much attention to them, and I just focused on playing around with the other kids. I did see her greeting my dad's mom and dad, though. About 10 minutes had passed when my mom called me to play games. I played different arcade games for an hour or two. After a while, I kind of got bored, and I realized I had to use the bathroom. I went looking for my mom, but I couldn't find her. No matter how much I looked around, I just didn't see her. However, I did find my uncle. For now, we'll call him John. I asked where my mother was, and he responded back with, Why, do you need something? I told him I needed to use the restroom, and he said that he would be happy to take me there. Being a six-year-old child, I didn't really know any better. I then said yes, and he began to lead me to the back area where all the restrooms were. When we got near, I had saw the bathroom sign, but John didn't stop walking. I remember telling him, hey, I think we passed the bathroom. I repeated this a few times until I realized he wasn't going to stop walking. He took my hand and he grabbed it tightly. I then began crying at this point because I was really scared and he was now hurting my arm with his clenching. With the music playing and all the kids screaming, I don't think anyone could have heard me. He then opened the back door that led to the back of the Chuck E. Cheese. But before the door shut, I noticed my mom walk out of the bathroom. I then screamed as loud as I could before the door shut. John put his hand on my mouth and he just kept telling me it would be okay. I tried kicking him, but it didn't do anything. John was really tall and kind of buff, so there really wasn't much a six-year-old child could do. Not even a second later, the door opened again. Me and John turned our heads at the same time. John took his hand off my mouth when he saw who it was. It was my mom. I then smiled when I saw her. She then asked, John, what do you think you're doing? He immediately grabbed me by the shoulder and then pinned me to the wall. I let out a yelp when I then hit the wall. John then said, You better walk away before I cut her throat. My mom then shouted at him, You wouldn't dare do a damn thing to my kid. And he replied back in a very cunning voice, Oh, really now? I turned my head a little to see what he was up to when I was met with a knife to my throat. I began crying heavily at this point, and my mom was just standing there not knowing what her next move would be. This is where it starts to become a blur. My mom said that I had bit his hand, causing him to stumble back and then let me go for a second. That's when I ran to my mom, and she said that he lunged at her and began punching her. 
being a little kid and seeing your mom getting beaten up is absolutely traumatizing. She then told me that she was about to pass out from all the hits he was throwing, and then they suddenly stopped. When she looked up, she noticed him screaming in pain because I grabbed his knife and I stabbed it into his leg. She wasted no time, and she took this opportunity to get up and then drag us inside. When we got back up and got inside, my mother collapsed on the floor, and I ran into the arcade area, screaming for help. Within a few seconds, the workers were on the phone with the police, and there were others checking to see if my mom was alright. I looked around, but I didn't see my dad's family at all. It's like they were all just gone at that point. Whenever I look back at this now that I'm 16, I can see why it's a blur to me. My mom ended up being fine, and when we got to the hospital, they had us file a report, and they kept asking me what happened, but I was really worried to speak on it. So I just stayed silent by my mom's side. My mom did have to stay in the hospital for a few days, just so she could heal up. She had a mild concussion and a broken nose. She told me that my dad had told her that apparently his brother was a registered sex offender and that he was only let out just a few months before my dad's passing. So when she saw him there, she knew it wasn't going to be a good day. I'm so grateful to my mom for saving me that day. But whenever I tell her I'm so glad she did that, she tells me that I'm the hero because I saved her from him. My uncle went to jail for assault as well as attempted kidnapping and murder. He's said to be released on August 12th of 2026. To John, I really hope we never meet again, and thank you to everyone who listened to my story. I'd like to share my personal story of why I can't bring myself to help strangers out much nowadays. This was a few years ago in 2017, And over the years, I've really thought to myself, maybe my story just isn't as scary as I thought, but I was sure scared when it happened. I guess I'll let you decide if it's truly that scary. It was around 1 p.m. that day when I was walking my fiancé out to his car before he went to work. We were outside my apartment in an area of our city that we're both pretty familiar with. So when a random stranger asked us about our neighbor, We didn't really think too much about it. He just asked if we knew the lady who lived there. I responded back with, I've only really talked to her a few times, but from the looks of it, I don't think she's even there. My assumption since I didn't see her car in the lot. I carried on saying my goodbyes to my fiancé, who kissed me goodbye, got in his car, and then headed to work. As I was walking back to my apartment, the stranger who was still standing on my neighbor's porch then said something to me, but I didn't understand him. Now, me being the nice person that I am, I walked a bit closer to him to understand what he had just said. At this point, I had made out that he was asking me if I could call a number for him. The number according to him was supposed to be my neighbor's phone number. I decided to be helpful and dial the number for him, and I had put it on speaker so he could hear them. I've never really been a fan of handing my own phone over to strangers. When we finally reached someone, they asked who he was, and they claimed they didn't know him. Then they promptly hung up. I apologized to the guy for a sour look, and began to walk away. This is when he began to comment on how hot it was outside, and how he had no ride now, since the neighbor wasn't home to give him a ride. Now, to be fair, it was Texas in the summer. Once again, being the nice person I am, I offered him some water, Yeah, water would be nice. That was his reply. As I started inside my apartment to grab him a bottle of water, he began explaining to me how big of a believer in God he was, how nice of a person he was, and how he would especially never hurt a hair on my body. In my opinion, if you're a really good person, you really shouldn't feel the need to explain that to someone. That was odd to me, but so are lots of people in the world. Anyways, I brought the water back out to him, and at this point he was sitting down on my porch, which I immediately thought was kind of odd. I hadn't invited him to hang out with me, I only decided to be nice and offer the guy some water. It was at this point that I began to feel a bit weirded out. 
I didn't want to just go inside and leave this stranger on my porch alone. After all, I'm a 5 foot 2, 125 pound female, and some strange guy sitting on my porch is a little odd. Thankfully, in the back of my mind, I knew that my friend was coming over on his lunch break, and he's a pretty big guy, 6 foot 2, 250 pounds. We'll call him Brandon to avoid using his real name. So with him showing up within five minutes of this guy inviting himself over to my porch, you could say I was pretty relieved to see him pull up. Let me stop right there real quick, and also add that in about two minutes before Brandon pulled into my lot, this guy starts asking all about my fiancé, and if he would be gone from work for a while. He then proceeds to tell me that my fiancé is a very lucky man. I have no idea why I felt inclined, but nervously, I then asked him, and what makes you say that? That's when he then began to comment on my body, telling me that I had a beautiful body and that he could definitely tell I worked out a lot. I watched as his eyes wandered up and down my body and then onto my butt, which made me even more uncomfortable, as you can imagine. About this time, I see Brandon's car pull into the parking lot. Brandon got out of his car and I could already very see the clear concern on his face as to why this random guy was sitting on my porch with me. With Brandon being on his lunch break, I knew that he couldn't stay for long. So we proceed to sit there and make small talk with the guy for about five minutes until Brandon then asked me if I have my phone on me and that he also knew my fiance had been trying to get a hold of me. We'll just refer to my fiance as Justin. I went to grab my phone and I realized that Brandon had just texted me, and that he had actually made that up about Justin just to get me to look at my phone. He sent me a text that then read, Hey, are you good? Is this guy straight? I feel like I'm glad I showed up. If you need an excuse to leave, just say Justin needs you to bring him something at his work. That was a good idea, and I decided to go outside and tell them both that I needed to take Justin his phone charger, which he had left at home. After going out and announcing that I was going to leave, Brandon had made some food in my place while on his lunch break, and he went inside to grab his food. That's when the stranger began asking me if I was leaving, and if I could give him a ride somewhere deeper into the city. The location he wanted me to take him was also where a bunch of robberies had recently taken place, as well as a few fatal shootings that also involved robberies, and it was less than a week ago. Again, being the nice person I was, even though I really wanted to say no and shut the fucking door in his face, I tried to make an excuse for why I couldn't while also being nice about it. That's when Brandon came back out and then caught wind of the conversation we were having. At that point, I went inside to grab my keys so that I could try and leave quickly without this guy taking notice of me. As I went back outside, I noticed the stranger was walking away and he had disappointment in his walk. Brandon took me inside and he told me that while I'd been inside, he had told the man that I wasn't going to take him anywhere and that he needed to leave right away. The man then insisted that this wasn't up to Brandon and that he was still going to ask me. Once again, with more force, Brandon told the man that I wasn't going to take him anywhere and he wouldn't be allowed in my car alone with me. The man still insisted on asking me. When Brandon decided it was time to get stern and then told him, Look, dude, I'm speaking for her right now, and she's not going to take you anywhere. You need to leave before I kick your ass. And with that, the guy left. And with the fact that I had said that I was leaving, and knowing that creep was still walking around the lot outside, I knew I should leave and drive around a bit just to make it more believable. Brandon walked me out to my car, and he told me to be safe and to also keep an eye out since he was going back to work now. I drove around for about 20 minutes before returning home. Before I went home though, I made sure to reach out to my brother to meet me at my place just to keep me company for a while. I actually beat my brother to my apartment, and as I was driving down the road leading to my complex, I made eye contact with the same creepy guy. He saw me drive by him as he was walking down the road away from my complex, but at that point I assumed that he was finally actually leaving and that I would be safe. I get to my apartment, and I go inside and lock the door to await my brother. We'll call him Calvin. I kid you not, not even one minute after I went inside and locked my door, I heard a knock at the door. 
My stomach dropped, as I knew there was no way in hell that Calvin had made it here yet. I looked out the peephole, and sure enough, it was the creeper. Standing on my porch again, only this time he knew for sure I was home alone. I ignored his knocks, and I took my shoes off so I could walk more quietly to avoid being heard by him. I heard him knock again, and then he began saying random slurs at me usually used towards women that start with a C and B. I'm sure you can use your imagination. He was doing this through the door and demanding I open up. I then ran up the stairs to hide in my room. For some reason, that just felt safer. I knew I'd have the bollocks to jump out of the second story window if I needed to. It felt like hours had passed since I had talked to my brother, so I gave him a ring, and when he answered the phone, I asked him, Dude, where are you? He's on my fucking porch right now, banging on my door. That's when I was able to look out my bedroom window and then see Calvin getting out of his car across the lot. I asked him if he could see the guy on my porch, and he replied back with, Yep, yeah, I definitely see him. He took off pretty quickly when I started walking to your door. It was finally at that point that I thought it would be smart to call the police. They took my description of the guy, and they said they would send an officer to patrol the area, and also have an officer call me shortly to check up on me. Fast forward about an hour later, I finally get a call from a police officer. The conversation goes like this. Well, we found the guy you called about, and he's been arrested. And my head knocking on my door and creeping me out wasn't really enough to be arrested, so surely something else happened. Oh wow, that's great to hear. Um, what ended up happening with that? Well, he ended up stripping off all of his clothes, running and dancing, and doing push-ups in the middle of the street. At this time, we believe he was extremely high on PCP and hitting a peak. At this point, my mind is racing, and I'm freaking the hell out. What if Brandon hadn't been there to make this creep go away? What if Calvin hadn't been available to show up? This guy obviously had pure intentions, given the high amount of PCP in his system. And you know, the berating and creeping on me. I'm really glad I trusted my instincts on this one. Who knows what could have happened to me if I'd given him a ride, or if I'd opened the door when I was there alone. I'm glad that I never have to find out. I really hope people learn from this, and start taking the saying stranger danger way more seriously. The story happened during my junior year of high school, so I was around 17 at the time. I live in a beach town in North Carolina, and I was in my first class of the day, physical science. We were working on our assignments, and the fire alarm started going off. Everyone thought it was a typical fire drill, so we evacuated the building as usual. After getting outside, Staff started instructing us to get further away from the building, and we learned that there had been a bomb threat called into the school. We ended up staying outside on the football field for six hours, while law enforcement brought in the dogs and searched every single book bag in the building. Everyone got severely sunburned because it was around springtime when this happened, so it was really hot here in North Carolina. When they brought us lunch, it was frozen ham and cheese sandwiches, and they were frozen solid. Eventually, we were all given the clear to re-enter the building shortly before dismissal that day. I know this story isn't all that scary, but it really is when you think there's a bomb inside of your school and that everyone's safety is at risk. I really hope that none of you or your future children ever have to go through that same level of stress. Be safe out there. I was in high school when this happened. I'm a girl, and this went on when I was 18. The story starts when I was getting coffee in between classes with a classmate. A creepy 40-something-year-old man came up to us, and while we were sitting down talking about coffee we're getting and about classes, he starts to tell my friend that he's sitting in a seat. For some context, this was a cheap corner shop coffee next to a gas station. So there's no assigned seats, just two chairs and a table, and whoever was first and lucky that got to sit down. 
My classmate, not wanting to look intimidated by him, starts to telling him that this isn't his seat and that he's not moving since he was the first one there. There was something really scary about this man and I was already shaking. The next thing I know, he's threatening my colleague, telling him he's going to shoot him. Even though he doesn't pull out a gun and we live in a country where gun permits are very hard to get. But I get extremely scared and I go inside the coffee shop to order my coffee because I couldn't stand sitting next to that man one more second. The worker at the store tells me that the man is crazy and that we shouldn't take him seriously. People in my country, me included, are kind of used to crazy homeless people and we encounter them pretty much on a daily basis so it's not really seen as such a creepy thing. But I have a lot of anxiety anyways, and the thought of being killed by this random crazy man just made me freeze and made my heart drop. Anyways, as this man and my friend are having a steering contest outside, the creepy man backs away and leaves, congratulating my friend for being brave and not being intimidated, and then leaves. As he's leaving, I'm thinking that's it, and it was just another creepy homeless dude. As a disclaimer, I'm not using homeless as an insult. I'm simply stating the obvious since he was carrying big bags with a lot of clothes on his bike. Well, fast forward to summer vacation. I'm in the inner city meeting up with some friends at another coffee place than the one in the first encounter, and I see the same man. He seems to recognize me, and he starts walking towards the coffee place. He just stays some meters away from me and then stares at me and my friends. I begin to tell my friends about this man, how scared I am of him, and they all start swearing at him and showing him the finger, but he just stays staring at me like a crazy person, as well as smiling with the most unnerving smile that I've ever seen. I don't know how to explain it, but I've just never been so scared of a human being in my life. He had a malicious smile that really made me freeze with anxiety. After a while, we all started ignoring him, as he wasn't leaving, and when it was time to go and separate from my friends, I just couldn't think properly, and I said I was going to take the bus with one of the friends I was with, so I wouldn't be alone in the bus stop with this creepy ass man, because at this point, I was pretty sure he was going to follow me to the bus stop at least, if not, maybe even my home. We start walking to the bus stop, and of course he's following us. I began feeling a hundred times more scared than before. For some context, he's with his bike as the same time he was when I first saw him. He's a bit ahead of us on his bike, stopping from minute to minute just to check if we're still going in that direction. My friend had also asked some of the boyfriends of hers which were at the coffee place to walk with us and to walk with us to the bus stop to feel a little safer. In order to get to the bus stop and the bus, we had to get across this road. He remains on the other side of the road and we then exhale as we then realize he didn't take the bus with us. The man just starts waving, smiling with that same malicious smile while the bus is leaving. At this point, I then get off after a few stops since the bus my friend was taking wasn't going in the direction of my house and I just call my mom and dad to pick me up. My dad picks me up and I tell him what happened and he's livid. He tells me the next time I go out he's going to come with me and sit far away and then just observe to see if the man shows his face again. Anyway, I don't go out for a while being scared and all and a few months pass and I don't see him again. I had really started to forget all about him until one late summer night. I was out with my ex and my cousin and we wanted to go to a club. Since this was right after the pandemic, the clubs only held parties outside and the party was on the street and the DJ booth was placed basically on the window sill of the street facade. We get some drinks from inside the club and we go outside to dance when I then see a bike and a man on it. I wasn't really sure if it was the same man or not since it was dark outside, but I tell my ex and cousin who were up to date with what was going on with this man. Thankfully for me, and really unluckily for the other people at the party, the police were called for public disturbance by the neighbors on that street, so they were there to shut down the party. As the man is circling around us on his bike and smiling, 
I then realize it's definitely him. I go straight to the police officer that was at the end of the street, and I tell him what's going on. When the man sees this, he instantly starts pedaling much faster, and I then lose sight of him while trying to pinpoint him to the police officer. The policeman just tells me that there's really not much that can be done since the legal system is shit in our country, and that if I make a complaint about this guy, he'll most likely be let out with a warning and that he'll only be in jail for one night and then let free. He proceeds to explain how the only way to put him away for good is if he actually offends, which makes me angry as hell on the inside, and I also feel really disappointed again in the legal system of our country but at least I got him off my back for that night. The last thing the officer tells me is to always be aware and be safe, and to never walk alone at night, since there had been a lot of reports of attacks in a park which was really close to the club we were at, as well as the center part of the city in general. That was the last time I saw him, but I still really remember it to this day, and I probably will never forget this man's face for as long as I live. I really feel rage towards him to this day because he managed to make me feel so vulnerable and disarmed. I couldn't and will never understand why someone would want to cause so much psychological pressure to another person. It really is messed up. When I was in high school, I didn't have any friends. I mean, I wasn't the kid sitting on their own in the corner of the schoolyard kind of thing, but I just didn't have any solid friendships or groups. However, my second cousin who was related to me through being fostered by a distant relative was in the same year level as me. Through being somewhat related, we became very friendly, and I was introduced to a small trio of mates. I had shared similar interests with them, like computers, video games, books, and more stuff. So I didn't mind hanging out with them. Now, my cousin was always strange. Weird and strange and peculiar, I'd say. But I accepted this, as I'm a fairly eccentric person myself, and I pretty much put it down to him being a foster kid with a really rough upbringing. Apparently, his biological mom's addiction is what led him to being taken by child services and then ending up in a foster home. Sad, I know, but not uncommon, unfortunately. Along with his odd behavior, the other guys and I suspected that my cousin was also gay. It was more of an uncomfortable, humorous suspicion based on his flamboyant personality and touchy-feely antics. There were a few times when we'd all play fight wrestle and get each other in headlocks, that kind of thing, where we swore that one time he was, should we say, physically aroused from it. Needless to say, we avoided any physical interactions from then on. Don't get me wrong here, we weren't anti-gay or anything, but you can imagine the discomfort, especially when you're 14. But regardless of the strangeness of my cousin, I was dealing with an alcoholic father on a daily basis, and a subsequent turbulent home life myself. So I think I stayed friends with them in a kind of kindred spirit way, based on the account of us both having screwed up families. Now to continue the story, it's important that I describe this next part, and I hope it makes sense to any non-Australians. Now in my town, there are a whole bunch of high schools scattered across the area but when students have to finish year 10 from their respective colleges and then move on to year 11 and 12 before they graduate, almost every student is sent to the same big school right in the middle of town. Strange concept, I know, but it's kind of cool that every public school teenager in town spends two years all together. You meet new people, attend big parties, and you pretty much forget about the last four years you spent at your old high school. Importantly, though, when you attend this particular school, you have complete autonomy and responsibility for your own class attendance. So if you want to skip any periods and just walk into the city to get some chips and gravy, buy some clothes or music, or just loiter, there's nothing to stop you. So you can imagine what it's like to go from being under constant authority for four years to suddenly attending a new big school and in the middle of town with complete freedom to come and go as you liked. So, with the school being in the center of town, 
There was a big public park that served as the school's unofficial grounds. And importantly to this story, neighboring the main campus building was a primary school. Like me, my cousin wasn't too interested in studying, and the newfound freedom only enhanced our apathy towards school, particularly attendance. We'd walk into town, buy coffee and food from the cheap bakery, and we'd spend hours at the Land Cafe playing Command and Conquer Generals, as well as Battlefield 1942. Yeah, that gives you an idea of what time period this took place in. One day, as I was expecting that we would visit our usual haunt, my cousin tells me that he's heading next door to the primary school, and I should come along. Apparently, he had been granted access to the school to help children read, and he had been doing this for some time. As someone who loves reading, grammar and literature in general, I thought, sounds fun. So we entered the primary school, and the whole time my cousin is leading the way, and we walk up the main stairs through the corridor and into a busy, noisy classroom. The teacher of the classroom acknowledges us, and she just continues on with her work without really paying any attention. Strangely, I didn't even have to explain why I was there. I remember listening to kids who must have been in grade 3 or 4 read and helping them pronounce words, etc. And thinking to myself, surely this all must be legit, right? But how odd is it that we just walked in like this? I happen to notice that my cousin is spending pretty much the entire time with one particular student. He seems to have familiarity with this boy, and he even introduces me to the kid. The boy seemed really happy to see my cousin, and my cousin likewise. Hmm, this must be his favorite student, I thought, and I went back to listening to the reading. The second time he took me to the school, the teacher of the classroom wasn't expecting us. I can vaguely remember her saying something like that she didn't know anything about it, and it was probably best that we come back another time. Weird, I thought. But maybe there really was just some mix-up, and the teacher wasn't notified of us. In case you were wondering why I kept going, I'd always shown an interest in education, and at one point... I had even studied for three years to become a primary school teacher myself. That is, until changing a career choice for something a little less stressful. However, the third time my cousin asked me to join him, I agreed. But this time, it was different, and I never went there again. As we were approaching the main campus building, with him leading the way as usual, I got a strange feeling. It was a different time of the day compared to the last two times, and there seemed to be a lack of confidence in my cousin. Upon approaching the door, he seems nervous, like he's really reluctant to go in. He hesitates as he pushes the entrance doors open and sort of just creeps through the hallway, up the stairs, cautiously looking out for somebody. We make it up the stairs and into the corridor just outside the classroom, and he's just kind of hesitating to do anything, all the while with this creepy, cheeky grin on his face. This time the classroom isn't noisy. There's no hustle and bustle, just quiet murmuring coming from outside. I can distinctly remember thinking, we're really, really not meant to be here, are we? And I asked my cousin what exactly it was that he was doing here. Are they expecting us this time? He still had that disturbing, presumptuous grin on his face. Assuming that they were indeed not expecting us again, and that we're going to get in trouble, I left. I just thought in that incident that my cousin was just being audacious. I mean, he was an audacious person, stealing money from his parents, hacking the school's admin and so forth, so I just thought that was another aspect of it. That was until one day as we were chatting... He had mentioned the boy from the classroom, the one that I saw him fixated on. He told me that he'd still been going over to the school to see him, to talk to him, not only in the classroom, but also at the playground as well. My cousin also said that he'd seen him outside of school, and that he'd actually gone to watch him play soccer on the weekend, and that he was also planning on going again next Saturday. Yeah, off go the alarm bells. Even more confronting was that he even proposed visiting the boy's house. 
I can't really remember how I reacted in that moment or what I even said. I think I just did the whole, oh, okay. But in my actual mind being like, what the actual fuck? And I had started to put all of the pieces together. The constant visits to the school, the trespassing and sneaking into the campus. He was never ever meant to be there. There was no helping kids to read. There was no assisting the teacher. None of it. It was all just a cover to see this one boy. My cousin, only 16 years old, was stalking a child, and I was the only one who knew about it. After much thought, I eventually decided to contact our school's assistant principal. It was more of a, this is something to be concerned about, right? And I briefly told her everything I knew, what my cousin had said, and what he was doing and what I had seen. I received a reply email, and she was, well, very, very interested to talk to me. I can remember sitting in her office, a large room with old portraits and books, thinking that I'm way over my depth here. I was crapping myself, thinking that I was going to get in trouble for being an accomplice or something, and that I just opened the lid of something bigger than I could handle. But the assistant principal was actually very supportive, and after a few face-to-face -face meetings, the school took action. I don't actually know what they did, but my cousin was definitely banned from even going near the primary school. He dropped out, or he might have even been expelled. I don't know, but he just kind of vanished. I also think that the police were notified too, and subsequently, this must have put him on their radar, because the story doesn't quite end here. A few years later, I had saw an article in the local newspaper. It was concerning a local man who had been arrested for grooming a child and suspiciously observing and stalking the grounds of a primary school on a constant basis. His home was raided and his computers were confiscated. The hard drives were loaded with child pornography as well as personal photographs. And after numerous charges, he was consequently jailed. Interestingly enough, the man's name was printed in the article. And as you guessed it, it was none other than my cousin. I was shocked, but oddly not surprised. And I thought to myself, did I without knowing begin a process all those years ago that led to the apprehension of a predator? What if I had ignored it and not taken action, and in not doing so, prevented something much, much worse? I'm just really glad I took action when I did. Disclaimer. There's a suicide at the end of this story. This is a long story. My stalker lasted over several years, and it's taken me a few years to really get going with my life after this. At the time, I was in my mid to late 20s, I would say I was an average looking female, at least in my opinion. I'm also a little bit on the chubby side. I had worked in retail for over 10 years. My last retail jobs were for two clothing stores and a baby store. Yes, I was working three part-time jobs in a small city, largest in the state. At the time, hardly anyone was hiring for full time because they didn't want to pay for benefits and whatnot. My first job was at one of the two clothing stores in an outdoor mall. One day, an older guy walked into the store. Not knowing his name, he'll be known as Bob. Bob was roughly in his early to mid 40s. He was balding on top with quite a few age spots. Bob had bad posture with an ill-fitted suit. The ill-fitted suit made him look bigger around his midsection. He also had some yellowing teeth, with a black spot on a couple of the front teeth. Bob came into the store and just looked around, really. I was working in the kids' section of the clothing store. Bob stopped in front of me after browsing the store. I was refolding the shirts. He tried to get a look in my face before proceeding to ask for help. This happens quite often to me when working on the sales floor. I was anticipating answering the normal questions about the clothes, which I normally get. For example, my child is eight years old. How would this fit them? 
Why are these clothes so expensive? They're cheaper at Walmart. And of course, do you know how many kids I have? Do you have a multiple children discount? Yeah, every day wanting to tell people off who ask questions like this. In this case, Bob wanted to know how to pronounce my name and my name tag. Do I have a boyfriend? How old am I? And what days will I be working at this store? This does happen sometimes, and I would usually have an answer to distract away from these questions. But this time it was different. His smile was off. He leaned in with every question, and the musky smell that reeked off of him would put you into a daze. I was stunned, and I probably had a weird look on my face. That's when my coworkers noticed that something was off about me. When they saw me in distress, they came over to get me away from the situation. My coworkers knew, but not Bob. One of my coworkers came and told me to go to the back, that the manager needed me. My walkie must be dead, so I should go change it out. And she told me she would assist the customer for now. So I left and I went to the back. I approached the manager in her office and I had to let her know what had happened. She closely watched Bob and the cameras in the office. In the meantime, I was working some back stock in the back. From here, my manager told me to let her know if I see him in the store again. She was willing to help me at all costs. Following this first encounter came many more. Since I worked part time for this store, I had no regular schedule. I was just scheduled whenever I was needed, sometimes early morning or even closing. Since Bob didn't get his answers the first time, in his mind he had to try more. Bobby kept coming in and requesting to see me. As part of the policies, we couldn't give out the other employees' schedules. When I would be working there was also a heads up from another coworker. They gave me time to go to the back, just in time. When Bob leaves, I get the okay to go back to the front. Upper management found out, and they had changed my hours to restocking, which was fine with me. So I was working back stock and regular stock when the trucks came in, two times a week. I didn't have to deal with rude customers. The only setback was that work had started at 4am, and I had to be there before the truck to help unload. Because I could only work these hours, I didn't really make much. This is where the second job comes in. I got a job at a baby store, which was a five minute drive via the freeway. I had to learn all the products available in the store. I had started this job and I had only been here for about three to four months now. I was mostly assigned to the clothing and accessories section. I never got to start the registers yet. One day I left my first job late. I was usually out by 10 a.m. and I had started my next shift at my second job by 11 a.m. Yes, I would normally have plenty of time to get to job two and be changed into the uniform that was required. On this particular day, the truck was late though by 30 minutes and because this batch was a new collection, which usually changes by season, I had ran late by one hour. I called in late to my second job. After finishing my shift from the first job, I called my second job in the parking lot on my way to my car. Like a fool, I never really got to look around the parking lot. I was just way too focused on getting to my other shift. At this time, without knowing, Bob was in the parking lot, sitting in his vehicle. Because I only saw Bob in the store, I had no idea at the time what he drove. I was also parked in the back of the store that's where we were permitted to park. This was a spillover lot. After getting to my car was when I then realized that I forgot to change into my uniform. The uniform was sitting in the back of my car. I figured it would be too much of a hassle to go back inside and change, so I decided to change in my car. Because of me being in marching band in high school, I was able to change in my car without flashing people. I changed from casual dress into my uniform for the baby store. I got to my second job and clocked in. The break room and offices are located upstairs. I had just come down from the break room. 
The door to the break room is located in the front near the bathrooms and the changing and breastfeeding area. The room is designated for breastfeeding mothers and people who needed to change their babies. As I opened the door and stepped out of the doorway so the door could lock, Bob had just appeared from around the corner, standing at the doorway with a huge smile, while the stale smell of cheap cigarettes wafted from him. My heart sank, and all of the blood felt like it left my body. My mind started to race with questions. How did he know I worked here? Why was he here? And he wears a suit all the time. Does he have a job? Why is he bothering me? I stood there paralyzed with a shocked look on my face. A look that brought a lot of joy to Bob's face. All of this was interrupted by a lady who had tried to squeeze behind him with her stroller. She had left the changing slash feeding room. This lady didn't say excuse me or try to get any of our attention so we could move. She just acted like her Buick of a stroller could fit anywhere. The stroller had knocked Bob forward and he had quickly put his arm out to catch himself on the doorway above my shoulder. He smiled some more. Those couple of seconds felt like hours of awkward silence. I was still terrified on how to react. The silence was then broken by one of the managers. She had just come into the shift and down the stairs. The door swung open and accidentally clips Bob's elbow. When he snapped back his arm, I kind of flinched. To the manager's eyes, it looks like the disheveled man just hit one of her employees. Bob scrambles to compose himself, stunned by my manager. She immediately asks if I'm okay. Still standing with a shocked look on my face, she takes me away from this guy. Before we could get two steps away from Bob, he had then choked out a, Hey, wait, she was helping me. My manager then asked what he was needing help with. He wasn't quick with the response, so the manager told him to come over with any questions he may have. She pulled me behind the register to talk to me. I then explained how Bob had stalked me in my first job. I'd let her know that my first job had already filed police reports about this man. Then I'd tried to file a harassment and stalking report with the police, but as usual, the police stated nothing can be done. From this day forward, my manager and upper management were aware of the situation, and they also kept security in the loop. We were in the small plaza. Security was mainly for the two bigger stores, which was the baby store I work at and a bed, bath, and beyond. The new rule that was implemented was for me to be escorted to my car by any employee available if security was unavailable. For my first job, security had to escort me through the outdoor mall to my car, and if security wasn't available, then a male employee escorted me. Most of the time it was security though, and yes, there were rumors on both jobs about why I needed security. Just like my first job, my second started to randomly schedule me during odd shifts. I still had many more hours than my first job though, but not enough to total a full-time job. Shortly after getting my second job, I got my third. Another high-end clothing brand. This time it was a 20 to 30 minute drive via freeway. I worked at the mall on the other end of the city. I was able to settle in quite nicely. Things have started to look up from here. By now, it's been a few weeks into the new job and no new sightings from Bob. I was so happy that it was ending, that he had finally lost interest. But before I could celebrate, while sitting in traffic, going from job one to job three, I then saw Bob waving to me from the next car over, stuck in stop traffic. He was there, staring and smiling. All I could think of is an expletive word. But before I could say it, the man had the gall to wave to me. Like if we were best friends in the past or something that had lost connection over the years. After another moment of feeling petrified, came anger. From the anger, my goal was to still get away. And yes, this was unsafe at the time, but I did what I could to get away from him. I tried to merge and get in front of as many cars as I could. I cut people off and I squeezed into spots that I know my car wouldn't normally fit. I'm not proud of that, but I felt at the time that it had to be done. 
knowing that the police wouldn't help. I eventually got to the mall and parked as close to the mall entrance as I could. Not to the main entrance, but to the back way that all of the mall workers can go through. I ran down the creepy corridor with flickering lights that barely kept the hall lit. I busted out one of the side doors that peeks through two of the mall stores. I got to the store and ran to the back. I didn't see Bob after that, and I kept a close eye on the storefront. No Bob. Did I get lucky this time? Hours passed by, and still no Bob. Soon days passed by, and just like before all my jobs, there hasn't been any new Bob sighting. I wait to celebrate though. The last time I tried to celebrate, Bob would come back into my life. So I just went on, working my three jobs. I was struggling with scheduling. Both job one and two added more hours. Getting enough sleep, eating normally, and just trying not to lose my damn mind. The first month of working all three jobs started to get easier to schedule. I can juggle the three a little better. Even though work was getting better, I started to have nightmares. Bob started to invade my mind. At work, I would get anxiety, imagining seeing Bob's face pop up anywhere and everywhere. Every time I would smell cheap cigarettes on a random customer, I would automatically imagine Bob with his yellow smile. I would feel an instant cold consume me. All of the anxiety really stressed me out, not knowing if Bob would appear from behind me. Knowing that it's been a little over a month, I know that Bob will soon make his appearance, and I knew that my new boss would have to know. The manager for job three listens and lets me know that I would be protected. Basically the same info that job one and two provided me. The supervisors, after hearing about my stalker, take it as a joke. Again, I'm on the chubby side. And to them, no one of my size could ever even have a stalker. So they mock me and laugh, saying that I should get over myself, that I'm just craving attention, and that I'm not pretty enough to get a stalker. I also want to add that job number three has a bunch of size zero model looking employees. Me and my chubby self didn't meet their standards for beauty. Another week goes by and dressing mostly mannequins and I ended up catching the eye of a guy who worked the jewelry counter at a jewelry store across the way. This guy only stared and smiled with the occasional wave. He would often bring snacks and food to me. I asked him not to, that it's nice but not wanted. I was too afraid that if I was nice to the guy he might take it the wrong way and then end up with another stalker. The jewelry guy wouldn't give up. Yes, he was always persistent but always nice about it. I did keep telling him that I'm not available or that I'm too busy for a relationship of any kind, but his kind gestures became creepy. Before it can get any creepier, Bob enters the scene. Bob had now found me in my third job. He would come by and stare at me through the window front. He had done this several times throughout the week. He would come and stand by the window. Occasionally, he would be pacing or sitting on the bench in the middle of the walkway wearing the same ill-fitted suit. I was so busy with work that I hadn't noticed Bob at first. Whenever he would watch through the windows, I was notified about Bob by the jewelry guy. The jewelry guy got protective and he had tried to lure away Bob. Again, dread had swept through me. Why is he doing this? How did the police not see this as a threat? Will I be safe when I go home? Will my family be safe when I go home? I live at home with my parents because I help take care of them. They really need help going to doctor's appointments and whatnot. This is the reason why I have three jobs, to take care of the bills. It's already been a few months since this started and I haven't told my family. I just don't want them to know and worry. Yes, they've been in the dark about Bob this whole time. Bob gets brave enough to enter the store and take his time. He would act like it's a game. He would look out from behind the racks, like his own version of Peekaboo, all with little glances and half smiles. By this time, he knows. He knows he's gotten into my head. I feel trapped with him in the vicinity. 
Soon the other employees take notice. Instead of helping me, they bring him towards me, and they then mock that he's my boyfriend. When he hears this, he lights up, like if they're his favorite words in the world. Once management gets complaints from the other customers about Bob's creepiness, it starts to really become an issue. I make complaints to the supervisors, and I plead for help. But they all just laugh and continue to mock me, even in front of Bob. Bob is okay with it, though, because they're feeding his delusional fantasy. Because the supervisors didn't take anything seriously, the complaints got to the manager and upper management. It got so bad that the district manager had to visit the store because no one was addressing the customer's complaints. When the district manager visits, it's camouflaged as a surprise visit. Of course, the district manager is appalled by the attitude and work ethic of the modelist employees. The whole store is not up to par. Everything could also look a whole lot better. When the district manager walks in, he's greeted by employees on the cell phones. Not caring who's in the store, I'm in the back working back stock and working the dressing room, trying to keep everything good and trying to help all of the customers on the floor. Before I can acknowledge the district manager, the jewelry guy comes flying into the store. The jewelry guy apparently knows who the district manager is and immediately requests to speak with him. The two then disappear into the back room. After being made aware of who he is in the store, everyone in the meantime tries to work harder to show that they're capable of working there. Very soon, I get called into the back, and as soon as I walk into the back office, I'm questioned about an older man who demands to see me. From what the district manager was told by all my supervisors and coworkers, was that the older man was my boyfriend and it really caused distractions. All of them lied. I was thrown under the bus. This made me angry, angry enough to cry. I spoke up with tears welling in my eyes, telling the district manager everything about my stalker. I had even given him the names and numbers to my two other job managers and that this is an ongoing issue. I also told him to look at the cameras. I had also explained to him how all the other employees and supervisors had only listened to me with deaf ears and made fun of me. The district manager actually listened. He questioned everyone who was working that day. They, of course, all lied for each other. But, of course, complaints that were filed by customers and the jewelry guy weighed in on things, too. The complaints that the district manager was there for didn't only pertain to me. It was also about the other employees and their lack of attention to customers. Sales were down, and management was really slacking on paperwork, as well as reporting the correct numbers for inventory. After a one-on-one -on -one with all of the store employees, the district manager came to the conclusion that the store's troubles are not because of the product, but because of the employees, and it helped him weed out all of the bad employees. There was a purge on most of the employees throughout that week. I got to keep my job, and I got the direct number for the district manager if I ever had any problems at the store. In the meantime, Bob was still lurking in the mall. Bob had also been given a copy of my schedule at my third job, so he knew when to be around. Most days I worked two jobs, but today I was scheduled for all three. My day started at 4 a.m. for job number one. It started slow, but went smoothly. Job number two was fine with no hiccups at 1 p.m. Job number three started at 6 p.m., and I came into the parking lot. I looked around the parking lot, and I didn't see anything suspicious. I walked to the entrance and down the poorly lit hall. When walking through the entrance, the heavy metal door slammed shut. I hadn't seen anything unusual, so I decided to take my time. I just kept going without looking back. The door slammed shut again from behind, and as I was about one quarter of the way down the hall, just thinking that it's another employee, I kept walking. But I did start to walk a little faster. The footsteps behind me sounded like a shuffling sound. The sound of them echoing off the cinder block walls. I took longer strides and a little more of a faster pace. The shuffling sound went from a slow pace to a light jog. My heartbeat started to fasten. I looked back and I saw Bob. 
He was running towards me in the hall. I quickly turned around and I started to run. I'm not going to let him catch me. He was moving quickly, his shoes hitting the cement floor echoing in the hall. His running sounded like he was coming at me from all directions. I just knew in my head he's going to do something to me and no one would ever know. But before I could get to the end of the hall, the door flew open and security was doing a walkthrough when I then yelled out for help. It took them a second to understand the situation before running towards me. While still running towards them, I looked back and pointed. He's the stalker. He won't leave me alone. And Bob turned around and ran. He was quick, but he wasn't fast enough to outrun security. They had caught him, and they phoned over to my job. The manager who was in the office for the time being took the call. I let him know what happened. A police report was made, another one for my collection, and I still had no standing ground with the police. Again, there was nothing at all they could do about it. By this time, I knew I had to call home. I just got too scared to be tough anymore. I called home in tears, and I explained to my parents about what happened. They were pretty mad because I never informed them about the stalker, but even more upset because they weren't able to protect me. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere by myself at all. One of my three brothers had to go with me, no matter where I went. I was dropped off at work, and I was picked up at work by one of my brothers. Three jobs for almost two years and on stalker watch, it had really started to take its toll. Not only on me, but for those who had to look out for me. My family, my co-workers, security... My mind had started to unroll, not only from rude and overprivileged customers, but also the anxiety and stress of knowing that Bob will come back again. I quit all of my jobs. I was unemployed for about a month or two before I got a full-time position for a health insurance company. And by this time, I hadn't seen Bob for a very long time. My security squad was disbanded. No more nightmares with little anxiety. I worked customer care for a medical insurance company. It was nice to be working in a different part of the city, still across town from where I lived. After working there for over four months, I noticed that a random car from patient parking would follow my car around the parking lot. For example, I was always in the employee parking, but parked whenever a spot was available. This one vehicle that was parked in patient parking one day is parking way too close or next to my vehicle the following day. I was cautious, but I thought of it as another worker somewhere in a different department. Besides, no one could follow me into the building because a keycard was needed. When I got done with work, so was the other occupant of the other vehicle. And no, it wasn't the same vehicle as my stalker, but they had always followed me towards my home. At first, it would follow me to the freeway. The following day, it got into the freeway, but got off before the interchange. The next day, however, it would get onto the interchange, but then it would get off soon after. Then it would almost follow me home. I didn't want to assume that it was a stalker, but going across the city to my home, I would often go different ways through the side streets and main streets. I ended up finding out where the police stations were. This vehicle would stop mid-city at first and then follow a little further each time. Once I pulled into the police station parking lot, the car would turn around and leave. I would wait in the parking lot for about 30 minutes before going home. It got to a point where I had to tell my supervisor. Security was kept on lookout for the vehicle and cops were notified. And yet again, They told me they couldn't do anything. The vehicle that had followed me had stopped. By this time, I had almost made it to a full year at this job. After finding another full-time job with better benefits, I quit this one. The new job was located further from my last job, at the very edge of the city, borderline into the next city. I was working for a medical supply company. It was an office job, on and off the phones. We were able to see new patients who needed instructions on how to use certain equipment, patient consultation. 
after working this job for a few months, that's when a surprise came. Bob came in, needing a fitting for some equipment. He recognized me through the glass. My desk was in the area where we can see the walk-ins and then notify whomever was able to help with the walk-ins. My job was mostly working with patient insurance. When I saw him, I got so scared. It felt like all of the blood drained from my body and my coworkers noticed. Everything that I had gotten over immediately came back within 10 seconds. My supervisor pulled me into the break room around the corner and out of sight of the window. I had to let him know about Bob and what had happened the last few years. I was struggling to keep back tears and not have a panic attack. My supervisor calmed me down before heading to the manager's office. He told the manager, I was able to stay in the break room and then just wait until Bob left. Bob didn't leave with ease. He had asked questions about me. No answers were given. When Bob left, I was able to get back to work, and shortly after, I was called into the manager's office. There I explained what happened in the past. Every time, I was seconds away from a panic attack. This time, though, I was able to go into a full panic attack. Bob kept coming back. This time, he wasn't going to let me go. Bob had started to come back with complaints of ill-fitted equipment and saying that pieces were missing. My manager had to stand next to me by my cubicle and stare down Bob. My manager would tell me to keep my head down and did not look up. One day when I went to have lunch in my car because the break room was full, Bob was waiting outside in his car. Then I noticed it. It was the same car that kept following me in my last job. It was the same vehicle. It was Bob. He casually got out of his vehicle and walked over to mine. I quickly locked the doors. What should I do? He has something in his hand. Is it a weapon? Am I going to die today? I try to calm my mind. Bob just stands there and says, I finally found you. I got scared and I called my manager, panicking. I told him about how Bob was outside of my vehicle. The manager came outside to escort me back in. I quickly fled with my manager back into the building. My manager put his arm around me and made sure to get my purse, and he had also locked my car for me. I was comforted by my other co-workers, and my manager called the cops. About five minutes had passed. Bob had come into the building raging and screaming. He said that he was always there for me. How dare I go into the arms of other men? The other employees in the previous management who were all male, he saw them as threats. That sent him off and fueled his rage. Hell, any guy I smiled at in general sent him off. He said how he followed me to make sure I was safe, that I couldn't get away from him. He then went off on another rant about how he imagined us being together, that he knew he found the one when he first saw me smile at him in the store, how that made him feel more than what any other woman has ever made him feel that we could be together no matter what. At the time, my manager kept telling me just to not listen. While on the phone with the cops, I got angry again. I'm not going to be scared. I then got up and went to the window. I ended up telling this guy off that I wasn't scared anymore. I called him sad and lonely, that no one wanted him, and I said some more mean things. Everything offensive to him, I said it. My manager pulled me away and asked me to go to the break room. He needed me to cool down. I for sure thought I was going to be fired. When right then, my manager walked in. He said that Bob got arrested. Destruction of property. He tried to shatter the window and he had trashed the front door. I got asked to leave early and to be ready for work the following day. I went home with my head held high. I beat him. I finally fucking beat him. The very next morning I went to work, feeling on top of the world because I finally confronted Bob. The day was going good, until late morning. My deskmate got a panicked phone call from her wife. Since my deskmate's wife was battling cancer, the phone call sent her chills. It wasn't the cancer, 
she went into remission. She got the good news from a doctor. She went to the mall to celebrate. She was hysterical and crying. But she had witnessed an older gentleman committing suicide in the mall. She stated that the older man climbed over the rails and how he was crying and saying that the love of his life renounced their love, that she had denied his love and didn't even want to give him a chance, that he was heartbroken and he had no other reason to live. He wanted to make sure that there were witnesses to his broken heart. He pulled out a knife from his pocket and he swiped it across his neck. He then fell head first off the second story. He landed on the ground head first. A loud pop had echoed through the mall. His body had landed near the children's merry-go-round. When my deskmate's wife described the man, she described Bob. I was really filled with happiness because he was gone, but also guilt, as he probably had a lot of issues, and I didn't know how to deal with his feelings. But because law enforcement didn't pay attention or didn't want to help for several years, this guy went about thinking what he did was normal. I'm not really sure if he had a family of his own, and there was little to no coverage by local news media. I never did get to know his actual name. I thought I would be okay after this. It's been 10 years since all of this happened. I'm going to therapy for it. I'm finding out that this was nowhere near my fault, but I still feel guilty. Always watch out for people. There really are some crazies out there. Hey everyone, I hope you all enjoyed these stories. If you ever want to submit your own, you can do so at southerncannibal.com. Have a good night, everyone. And remember, to always...